Was Noah's flood global or local? There's a major controversy within Christianity over that question. I'm Robert Carter. I am in the studio today with my dear friend, Keaton Halley. Hey, Keaton. How's it going? I'm doing good. Hope you're doing well. Um, we're going to try to tackle this very controversial, very difficult subject. Um, but I'm going to start off with a question for you. Uh, you have uh, theological training, uh, much more than I do anyway. You've taken classes and your degree is in... Christian apologetics. Okay, so you've taken a lot of theology classes. Yeah. Can you explain to me and to the audience, what is uh, the state of theology right now... In the, you know, what's their opinion on the scale of Noah's Flood? Well, I haven't done a survey or anything, but I certainly know there are a lot of uh, academics, even at Christian institutions, that are teaching that Noah's Flood was just a local event confined to the Middle East, that it did not cover the entire globe. I've heard that a lot, too. Yeah. Now, pe people like Davis Young, for example, a retired professor at Calvin College, has written several books on this subject, like The Bible Rocks in Time, where he argues that uh, not only was Noah's flood restricted to the Middle East, but it also didn't even kill all the people in the world. Wow. Okay, now, where does, does a theologian get an idea like that? Do they derive that from the text, or are they applying something from the outside to try to help them understand the text? No, I think as we're going to discuss, the, the evidence from Scripture itself is very clear. It's unequivocal that the flood was worldwide, and that it destroyed all the people except the eight on board Noah's Ark. And so by and large, I would argue these uh, theologians and scientists are um, allowing outside ideas to help uh, guide their interpretation of Scripture. And the bottom line really is that it's um, their understanding of the geological evidence, how they interpret the fossils and the rock layers. They believe they're millions of years old. And if that's true, then there can't have been a global flood. Okay, so we have two different things going on here. One is the geology and the archaeology aspects, and the other is what the Bible says. Yeah. Um, let's just start off with the Bible. Let's unpack it. Uh, tell me a few things in, in the scriptures that inform us on the scale of the flood. Yeah. Uh, certainly the way it's presented in, in the text um, is that it was clearly a global flood. You've got um, a number of things, like, for instance, the, the term all is used uh, over and over again throughout the account. Now, yes, it is. of course, the, the term all in some context can be um, an example of hyperbole. It, it doesn't always have to mean literally everyone in the whole world. That's right. We see a lot of examples of that in Scripture. Okay. Yeah, but in the flood account in particular, the, the repetition suggests this is a uh, superlative. It's, it's a way of emphasizing the point. Like it, it says, all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. It talks about every living thing of all flesh was destroyed. That and so is the, on. the Hebrew word coal, mm -hmm. all. And when it's doubled up like that, all the things under the whole heaven, that, that's pretty clear yeah. that it's it's universal in this language. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Um, yeah. You've got um, the, the water is said to cover the mountains by 15 cubits. Now, a cubit, of course, is from elbow to fingertip. Right. Um, yeah. 18 inches or a foot and a half. Okay. So that would be what? Over 20 feet. And um, it's clear, you know, if, if you have water covering mountains, the only way it can do that, since water seeks its own level, would be not just to flood a, a local area. Yeah. Um, because the water's a local gonna... flood even wouldn't even cover a local mountain. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Some people have tried to get around this by uh, saying things like, well, maybe it's snow covering the, the mountaintops and, and so mm, forth. But That's not a flood. Yeah. And, and the way it's described in the text is the, the waters prevailed on the earth mightily. And so the water kept rising until it covered the mountain peaks. If it was a local flood, where would the ark have gone? Mesopotamia is actually um, kind of a, a half bowl shape where the water, uh, I understand, would, would run off, I believe, to the south. You can tell me S if that's southeast right. Southeast into the Persian Gulf. Yeah. And okay, so in a local flood scenario, the Ark is going toward the ocean. Mm -hmm. But where did the Ark land? In the mountains of Ararat. In the mountains of Ararat. That is a hugely important passage mm. as far as our understanding of the globality, if I can use that strange <laughs> word, of, of, of the flood. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And some people sometimes misunderstand that. They assume the Bible says it landed on Mount Ararat. Um, yeah, not true. Uh, it may have, but it, it, the Bible specifically calls it the mountains of Ararat. Yeah, which so is it's a region. Range. Yeah. We don't know exactly where, where the okay. ark ended up, but it's, it's up high in the mountains. In fact, the text also says that uh, the water subsided for several months. Water, Noah was, was watching the water go down before he even began to see mountains poking up. 
yeah. from underneath the waters. Yeah, and so there's no way for the ark to land in a high elevation if the water's flowing downhill for months. Yeah. I mean, it would, oh, we also brought up something, though. We keep saying Mesopotamia. Mm. That doesn't mean that this is where Noah launched the ark from. Right. That's just the local flood advocates are having a, a local flood in Mesopotamia. In a global flood, the ark could have been anywhere. Yeah, we just know he, where he ended landed. up in the Middle East, yeah. but he didn't necessarily have to begin there. Uh, the flood of itself, of course, would have rearranged the surface of the Earth and, extensively. And, yeah. yeah, especially as it's coming off all that massive amounts of erosion are going to change the landforms a lot. Yeah, so more he, information. He didn't have to land in things. the same place where he he began. That's right. Uh, more information on those things on creation.com. You can look up where was Eden. Um, we'll we'll put some things in the show notes for you. Some some good stuff in there. Yeah. Okay. So scripturally, clearly, the Bible is discussing a global flood. Why do so many theologians think it's a local flood? What are they adding to scripture to help yeah. inform them? Well, historically, actually, um, as the the modern science of geology was just getting off the ground as a, a you know a, a discipline about two hundred years ago, uh, many of the pioneers in geological science they understood the flood to be global because they were influenced yeah. by scripture. Nicholas Steno would be one example. Those others, okay. yeah. Um, but but very quickly, uh, as they investigated the rocks of the Earth's crust, the rock layers and so forth that we see in road cuts today, they began to make assumptions about how those were laid down slowly and gradually. And they said, if that's true, um, all these layers were built up over millions of years, and in that rock record, you don't see any evidence for a global flood, according to them. And so uh, it was largely driven by the science of geology and their interpretation of it, that they began to uh, push aside Noah's flood as a global event and, and say, well, we must have misunderstood the Bible. It must be uh, on a smaller scale. And this happened in the mainly in the 1700s. Mm -hmm. I mean, 100 years before Darwin, Gerald just already talking yeah. about millions of years and things like that. To my mind, it was these European um, geologists, and they didn't have a model of a flood. They'd never really... They didn't have the hydrodynamics. They didn't have the physics. They, they didn't have what we have today. Mm -hmm. And so most of them thought the flood was tranquil. So the water comes up, the water goes down. Well, then what did it do? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe it pushed around a few sandbars or something like that. Yeah. And so they look at, you know, a river in Europe that might have overflowed its banks. And they go down and investigate and say, oh, look at this. You know, this much mud was deposited. Mm -hmm. Oh, in that case, it would take X number of floods to make, you know, a mountain chain or something like yeah. that. But they're really failing to grasp the power of the flood, the universal chaos of the flood. Mm -hmm. And so I think our models today are much more robust and can answer those early guys who, honestly, they, they didn't have the science we have today. They didn't really know what they were talking yeah. about. And, and so it's, it's very interesting, I think, the way that um, many Christians not, might not understand the way that this debate over the flood actually ties in with the age of the earth and the controversy there, because the, those who accept an old earth, they can't have a worldwide flood. But if you believe in a worldwide flood, then you must explain all the rocks and fossils in, in a short amount of time due to that flood. And that's based on scripture. And that also um, is where we derive the idea of a relatively young world, just thousands of years old. So if we had a worldwide flood, like scripture indicates, we think we can explain the rock and fossil record. Yeah based on that flood. But most of the theologians out there accept the millions of years precepts first, yeah, and then they're trying to, can we say, force fit the science into Scripture? Yeah, I think so. I think it's, it's the driving assumption uh, behind the way they read Scripture, which is not, not the proper way to do no, exegesis. To, to, you should allow Scripture to speak to you, uh, let it say what it says without imposing uh, extra-biblical evidence on on your interpretation. I was on a radio show about 10 years ago. I was pretty new to this, you know, creation speaker sort of thing. Yeah. And um, a, a caller came in and he called in and he said, okay, Carter, I hear what you're saying, but how come none of these theologians agree with you? Mm. And he started with Warfield and Hodges, and, and he rattled off a list of 12 or 15 theologians. I knew every single name. Yeah. And all of them were old authors. Mm. Well, I stumbled around with pretty lame answer at the time, but what I should have done, I didn't realize at the time, I should have said, okay, give me a theologian prior to Charles Darwin. Mm. What about Whitfield? What about Jonathan Edwards? What about, and 
all of these guys would have been what we would call a creationist of some sort. Yeah. Because the millions of years idea wasn't there. And so in one sense, some people are kind of saying that we needed Darwin to explain to us what the Bible means. <laughs> That's a really uncomfortable proposition. Right, definitely, yeah. Because the Bible says something radically different than what evolution tells us. Yeah, certainly. That. And the, the modern creationist movement didn't start in the 20th century. Um, oh, no. This has been the, the historic understanding of the, of the church from, from the beginning, that it was a global and catastrophic yeah. flood. Yeah. What else in Scripture indicates to us um, the nature of Noah's flood? Yeah, there, there certainly are a number of other things. Um, if you read the account carefully in Genesis 6 through 9... Uh, the flood didn't just last 40 days and 40 nights. Oh, no. That was how long it rained until the ark was lifted up from the earth. Um, the heavy rain period, it actually kept raining even after that. I imagine so. The, the flood itself lasted around a year's time. That's how long Noah was in the ark. The, the local flood, as you mentioned before, the waters would quickly subside, run out into the ocean. Um, a local flood doesn't last a year's time. No, in no case that I'm aware of. Yeah. Okay. You've also got the size of Noah's ark. Um, yeah, it's huge, like 450 the, feet long or something yeah, like that. that's right. The Bible tells us it was 300 cubits. That'd be approximately 450 feet long. Uh, so or, it's this, this giant ocean liner. Why would Noah build an enormous ark and put all the animals, uh, you know, representative kinds on board if it was just a local flood? And of course, why would he build the ark at all when he could just walk out of the area? Yeah, and, and the why? animals could have migrated out. The birds certainly could have you know, winged across to the next mountain range or something. What bird needs an ark to survive a local flood? Come on. Yeah. Okay. Um, You've got this idea of after the flood was over, God made this covenant with Noah and with all the animals that came off the ark. Um, He put a rainbow up in the sky as the sign of this covenant to say that he's never going to send another flood like this again. He's not going to destroy all life as he did. And we've certainly had a lot of other floods in modern human history since then. That's right. And they've, okay. they've killed some of the animals and some of the people, but if you believe the flood was local in Noah's time, then it only could have killed some of the animals and some of the people. And uh, considering the thought that maybe uh, a local flood gave rise to the flood legend, local flood in Mesopotamia, they've had a lot of other floods there since then. Yeah. And that promise that God made is completely irrelevant and contradictory if it's true history. Yeah. The point about there being only eight people on board, too. As I said, if you believe the earth is old and the flood was local, well, according to the secular dating methods, you've got um, human beings already dispersed around the world hundreds of thousands of years ago. Yeah. Um, And according to the secular study of genetics, there was no time in which the entire human population, you know, had a population crash and was reduced just to this little spot within the Middle East that could all be killed off by a flood. So you've got to say that there were survivors outside the eight on board the Ark. Yeah. Now, of course, I disagree genetically with the statement that right. you know, we had this large <laughs> population, we never ate people. But okay, from the secular standpoint, yeah, we have a massive problem because you have a flood in you know, a few hundred square miles, maybe. Maybe a lot of people die, maybe not all of them die, and you got this guy in the Ark and he lands... But there's, what, another million people out there or something yeah, like that? Yeah, right. So, yeah, it doesn't make much sense. Clearly not. And the New Testament confirms that well, there were right, just eight people aboard the ark. And, and the language even in the, the Genesis account is clear that it was from the survivors of the flood. God told them afterward to repopulate the earth, right? Um, yeah. The Table of Nations talks about Noah's sons giving rise to the, the various nations and so forth. Table of Nations in Genesis chapter 10. Yeah. And that's another thing, too, just the fact that God sort of reiterated these commands to multiply and fill the earth. That's the same thing he told Adam and Eve in the beginning, because the earth was empty at that time. There are no people yet. Yeah, so that there was a need to do that. The language is very universal there after the flood is over, and God is speaking to, to all the animals, to, to all the people, making his covenant with them for, for all the generations going forward. Okay, so we haven't gotten into the... Um you know, the other side of the argument, how they argue, but I don't think we need to either. Because we know what Scripture says, and we know what New Testament and Old Testament say. Um, We think we've got a pretty good handle on the genetics and the geology of of the flood, Mm -hmm. and we don't have to go there. We don't have to compromise Scripture, say words don't have meaning or mean something else other than what it looks like it it means. Um, And I'm comfortable with that. So thanks for watching. We hope you learned something here. Uh, Clearly, the Bible says the entire earth was covered by a flood. That is what the language indicates. We don't have to go 
down any other route and bring in some other information to help explain what it is. It is what it is. There was a universal flood during the time of Noah. All the animals on the earth that weren't on board the ark died. All the people on the earth that weren't on board the ark died. And the ark landed in a high location, not a low location. Therefore, it must have been worldwide. If you've enjoyed this, uh, you can find a lot more information on these topics, on um, the flood, ice age, genetics, geology, on creation.com, uh, articles, books, videos. We've got tons of stuff there for you. Please don't forget to like this, uh, click the bell so that you get notifications, share this with other people, with your friends and your family, and uh, join the conversation below. We'd like to hear from you.